Tonight's episode is brought to you by the world's only subscription box service for fans of cryptozoology, CryptoCrate. Visit CryptoCrate.com to get more information and to sign up today. And while you're at it, use coupon code MONSTERS88 for 10% off. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I'm your guide, Derek Hayes. Wow. It has been quite the week. It seems that more than a few of you enjoyed the Little Mirrored Man episode that I threw together. I've received so many messages about it. Messages of excitement, intrigue, terror, and even a handful of messages about the subtle change in format on the last show. Now, I had no idea so many people would enjoy that subtle change. But they certainly did. And I'll tell you what, that really excites me. And that really gives me some ideas for the future. Now, Monsters Among Us certainly is going places. And having audiences react to episodes the way they did last week only escalates that pace. But why should we stop there? If you're one of those that love the Mirrored Man episode, do me a solid. Share that episode with someone. Show your kooky aunt or your crazy grandfather. Or post it on your Facebook page or even poke the person in front of you right now on the shoulder and say, Hey, you want to hear something spooky? If you don't get punched, they're going to love it. The more listeners we get, the better the calls and the higher the production value and maybe even double the episodes but we need to build up that following first. So do me a favor, and somehow, some way, share that episode. Now this week's show has some huge shoes to fill, but I think we have the lineup to get it done. To kick things off, we begin where any great story does, the road. The following experience was submitted by an anonymous source. Hi, Derek. Right now, I want to remain anonymous. This is my first time calling. Recently just discovered your podcast about two weeks ago. I'm a truck driver, so I'm constantly looking for something to occupy the long days and long nights. And I discovered you on Spotify, and I would like to say I enjoy it very much. I have several things I would like to uh, tell you about. I know I can only do one first. Uh, The first story goes back to when I was a child probably about six or seven years old, so that would have been 1978, 79. At the time, I lived in El Paso, Texas. I lived in an apartment. I had two older sisters at the time, one younger sister. I would have been a a baby at that time. Uh, So it was bedtime, and I remember I was in my older sister's bedroom, in one of their beds. They weren't there. They weren't in bed or anything like that. I was there, and uh, with it being the 70s, they had this old, uh, like a stereo. It had a record player on it. Stereo was a huge piece. And big ta- sat on like a big table, and the two single beds kind of slid underneath it. And I was in one of the beds up against the wall facing the open bedroom doorway. And as I laid there, trying to go to sleep, there was a little bit of light illuminating the room from the stereo. And as I was laying there trying to go to sleep and looking towards the doorway into the darkness, uh, 
the way I've told the story before to other family members and friends have described it, it's like a fashion show came in through the bedroom doorway. There were faceless, kind of like gray looking, and the best I can describe them is mannequins. And at that time, at that age, I didn't know what a mannequin was, but they floated in the doorway like a foot a foot above the ground, no facial features, anything like that, and they were just in poses, you know, arms up, down, sideways, here and there, and they just kind of floated through the doorway in a little fashion show, floated in and passed me, and even though I was scared, I kind of just kept the covers up just below my eyes and watched them float through the doorway into the bedroom and then just gone. And that was pretty much my first experience with the paranormal. Since then, there's been many, many more. But those will have to come at a later time. Again, great job with the podcast. I really enjoy it. And it keeps me company <laughs> for the long drives I have. Take care and keep up the good work. Thank you, caller. I love stories from the road. All the energy flowing in one direction the history, the personalities. When imagining spooky things on the road, it's certainly not difficult to conjure images of ghosts of robbery victims in the Old West or diseased and dying pioneers traveling across uncharted territory. Or even a more contemporary version, the victim of a gnarly car accident. The point I'm getting at is this. I know I have a lot of truckers out there tuning in. I want to do a special episode just for you guys. So send me those weird windshield encounters. If it happened on the road and it can't be explained, that's definitely in my wheelhouse. When you do submit these stories, be sure to mention at the beginning of the call or the submission that this is for the trucker episode. That way, the call doesn't get lost. Thank you again, caller, for taking the time to share your story. Now our next installment of the evening makes its way to us all the way from the Tar Heel State of North Carolina. The following was submitted by Emily. Hey Eric, my name is Emily. I am such a huge fan of your podcast and I'm so excited to share a big cat sighting with you. I'm a fairly new resident to the mountains of North Carolina And on July 4th, I decided to take a road trip to Skinny Dip Falls, which is in Tuscan National Forest, about an hour from where I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Anyways, while driving on the parkway, I was behind a car that came to an abrupt stop. And when I looked out my front mirror, I saw that there was a cat in the middle of the road, but it wasn't a house cat. I assumed it was a cougar or a panther of some sort. It probably took up about half of a lane of one side of the road, so maybe three, four feet in length, two, three feet in height, and had a really, really long tail, at least 12 to like 24 inches, and very round ears, and I could not see its eyes. I immediately thought about you and your podcast when I saw it, because I listen to you often, and have heard about the conspiracy theories and the extinction about cougars and mountain lions and panthers in the eastern North Carolina mountains and such, but I wanted to share the story with you because I thought it was so fascinating. I've had other paranormal stories that I wanted to call in about, but this one I just could not hesitate. I hope you're having a great vacation and hope this is useful to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily. Now this topic is directly down my alley. The very event that got me interested in cryptozoology and paranormal as a whole was an alien black cat sighting I had when I was around 10 years old. Now I won't bore anyone with the details, but if you go back to the very first episode, you can hear a very nervous, very unorganized telling of that encounter. It seems that the entire eastern half of the United States has reports of these mysterious felines. I've received a few calls from west of the Mississippi, but a vast majority of the sightings are like Emily's, from the east. Now I'm not exactly sure what that pattern means, but with the now extinct eastern cougar out of that region, 
that it'd somehow make room for something more dark and more elusive. I wish we had answers to these questions, but through eyewitness testimony, testimony like Emily's, each day we get a little closer to finding the truth. Thank you again, Emily, for taking the time to share your encounter. Those black cat sightings certainly hit home for me. Now our next call of the evening might just prove that not all spirits are menacing. The following was submitted by an anonymous source. Hey Derek, it's uh, from Facebook. I was talking with you about a uh, spirit that helped me get out of a pretty pesky situation with the uh, police. This happened maybe 2014, 2015, around there. Um, I was living in the in the in the Poconos, and there's an old boiler factory that is kind of run down. Some of it's burnt and things like that. So uh, I used to go there and just you know veg out and you know do things. Um, at that time, I had long hair, um, living the, you know, rock and roll lifestyle, that kind of stuff. The weather that day was overcast. It was kind of cloudy. Um, I remember going to a room that was in relatively good shape. The ceiling was falling apart, but the floor was in pretty good condition. It still had walls. So we called that room the Angel Room because it used to be a skate park and somebody had spray painted an angel on the wall at one point. I remember sitting there one day just, you know, thinking about things and just, you know, vegging out when um, something grabbed and pulled my hair and tugged on it, but not hard, like to be malicious, just like enough to get my attention. I brushed it off, you know, thinking, you know, this is, I'm just imagining things, you know? So I continued just sitting there and looking around and chucking little stones And again, it grabbed and pulled my hair. And then I heard a voice say, leave. So I said, okay, that's definitely not my imagination. Let me, you know, just get out of here. As I was leaving that room, I saw a police cruiser pull around the corner as I was walking the opposite direction. And I just took off. So that night I found out that the police for that township was booby trapping the place because people were trying to keep up where people were committing arson in that in that in that building. So they were trying to catch people in the act. Just wondered if there was any other stories about people that have had, that have been helped by spirits like that. I prefer to keep my name anonymous. I am from Allentown. I hope you have yourself an amazing rest of your day. I love the podcast. Take care of yourself. Bye. Thank you, caller. Now, I guess at a certain point, this becomes a debate of philosophy. Is the ghost good for warning you or bad for helping you evade the police? Either way, it makes for a fascinating story, and it harkens back to some other stories that have been shared on the show over the years. Stories of ghosts doing helpful things, but one of those stories in particular sticks out in my mind. I believe I shared this story around season six, but it's the story of the time my dad ruined a pair of jeans and a disembodied voice tried to warn him. Now this voice, a voice that my grandmother would later go on to name Charlie said, that ain't right. Just as my dad leaned over to pour bleach onto his jeans in the washing machine, and as my dad learned that night, the voice, wherever it was coming from, was correct. He'd bleached his jeans into oblivion. Now I can say this, there definitely seems to be something helping some of these people out. Thank you again, caller, for calling in. Well, we heard about an overgrown cat, so I figured we'd give the opposition their fair shake. The following was sent in by Riley in the state of Idaho. Hey, Derek, this is Riley. First, man, I just want to tell you that your show is by far the best out of probably the 20 podcasts that I listen to. But my encounter happened... I was probably 16 or 17 years old, which would make it around 2004 or 2005. And I had just gotten my license maybe a year or two before that. So, But this was during the summertime. Um, I had been at a friend's house um, all night. I mean, you know, just having a party, doing what high school kids do. And I had left my friend's house to come home and... 
I live in uh, Boise, Idaho. Well, I live in Meridian, a suburb of Boise, Idaho. And to get to my house, uh, you kind of had to go down a back road. Not that anybody would know, but the Chinden and Linder was where it happened, or Chinden and Locust Grove. And around this road, there's not really very many houses. Uh, it's pretty rural. And as I was coming up to this light at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I could just see in front of me in my headlights, it looked almost like a, a pile of garbage or something laying in the road. And as I came up to it, I kind of swerved because it was, it was right in the middle of the, the turning lane. And so as I came up to it, I kind of swerved off to the side to go around it because I thought somebody had just lost a load of garbage or something out of the back of their truck. And so I slowed down. I was probably only going five or 10 miles an hour. And as I got up to it, I looked off to the side, you know, just to see what it was. And there wasn't any street lights or anything. The only lights were from the actual traffic lights, so it was pretty dark. But as I started to pass it and I looked down at it, uh, this massive head turned towards me. And all I could see was like the silhouette of whatever this thing was. And it had almost like the face shape of a dog with a, a longer snout. And the eyes were, they were red, but they weren't like a bright red. They were almost like a, like a deep red, if that makes any sense. And it scared the crap out of me. I had no idea what it was, so I just took off. I didn't even think about coming back by because I, I didn't want anything to do with it. It scared me that bad. And I saw this documentary... Um, and I know that there's these creatures, I believe they're in Russia, and there's a white one and a black one, and they're almost like a dog-like creature. Um, somehow they represent, you know, good and evil. I don't, I don't exactly know how the story goes, but that's all I could think of with how massive this thing was. I mean, it, it had the shape of a dog, but it was, it was big. Like, it, it probably took up, you know, half the length of my truck. So, yep, that was my story. Um, hope you can use it, and I love your show, Derek. Thank you, Riley. Now, the location of this sighting is not terribly far from the home of the Shankawarakan, or in English, one who carries off dogs. Now, this overgrown, wolf-like beast was actually shot, killed, and stuffed by a Montana rancher in 1896, but the body disappeared sometime after, as these specimens tend to do. But luckily, the mount has been rediscovered and can even be seen on display at the Madison Valley History Association Museum in Enos, Montana, a mere 32 miles from the location where the creature was killed and only 250 overland miles from where Riley had his strange encounter. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that I cover a similar call in the latest Patreon deep dive episode. On that particular episode, I speak with Kevin, who, like Riley, had a huge dog-like creature step out in front of his vehicle in Vermont. So if this subject floats your boat, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Monsters Among Us podcast. A $4 monthly pledge gets you access to not only that relevant episode, but to all past Patreon episodes. And I believe there are at least 17 to date. So at any rate, perhaps it was a loose wolfhound or shaggy Great Dane. Or maybe, just maybe, it was the infamous Shanka Warakan. So thank you, Riley, for not only submitting that call, but giving me the opportunity to say Shanka Warakan. Well, like a rickety train on a foggy night, we're barreling straight toward an encounter of the shadowy variety. The following is Claire's submission. Hi, it's Claire. So I want to share a, an experience that happened to me personally. One of my earlier paranormal experiences that I can still recall with clarity. I definitely would not put this past being like sleep paralysis or anything. Um, I don't normally ever experience that, but I know that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not you know, that, that can't happen to me. But, um, so I'll share this experience and I'll let you guys, you know, talk about it and see what you think. So when I was 12 years old, 
my family took a vacation to Williamsburg in Virginia, and we were staying in a hotel, and my sister and I were sharing one bed, and my parents were sleeping in the bed right next to us, and we were in the same room, and we were sleeping, and it was nighttime, and I remember just kind of bolting awake and, and sitting up straight in the bed, and I opened my eyes, and I looked towards the, so this this room had like um, an entryway, like a big entryway with no door or anything that went into the living room, the, ho- the hotel living room. So uh, I bolted upright and looked at this sort of tall entryway and I saw the black silhouette of a man with a fedora hat on standing in the doorway. And my dad wears fedora hats because he thinks it's cool. <laughs> but um, so I thought my initial reaction was, is that my dad? So I literally, I asked that question. I was like, Dad, is that you? Why are you awake? And I sleepily looked over to my right to see my dad sleeping in the bed right next to me, right next to my mom. And so I saw him sleeping there, turned my attention back to the doorway, and the man, the shadow man, you know, this black silhouette of a man with this hat, he's still standing there and that's when I realized he's taller than the door frame so he must have been like seven or eight feet tall because it was really big and all I can remember doing is just closing my eyes and going back to sleep and pulling you know the covers over my head and what's really creepy is that I I saw it again just a couple years ago when I was I was driving home late one night because I used to work at Starbucks and they used to close so I used to drive home and it would be like maybe around 11 o'clock at night. And um, I was driving and getting closer to my house. So I was slowing down. So when, where I live, it's kind of quartered off by blocks. So, you know, I was going down a block to get to my the block where my house is on. And so I was going slow. And right as I was going slow and crossing over the sort of four-way where a new block begins, um, I had this weird feeling that I should just like look to my left and I looked out the window and I saw the same tall figure, black silhouette with a fedora hat standing underneath a street lamp, seven or eight feet tall. And I just remember like slamming on the gas, pulling into my house and running into the house and locking all the doors. And I, I really think that it was something, I don't think it was my dad, I think I actually confirmed that because when I got in the house, he was also there. So I don't think it was him, you know, and I don't know. And that was just a couple of years ago. So I know that other people have said that when they have shadow man encounters, they tend to have multiple ones. So I don't know. Whatever you guys think, let me know. All right. See you later. Thank you, Claire. Now, I know I've probably mentioned this 100 or perhaps even a thousand times, but one of the theaters at the university I attended had a notorious spirit, and the entity was simply called the Hat Man. Now, I'd make it a point to always go inside if I ever saw the door open. Now, the theater was unassuming from the exterior. The main entrance, or marquee, if that's what you want to call it, was located in the middle of a ground floor hallway lined with windows and classrooms, almost as if your school cafeteria was a movie theater. The place was terrifying, but not because of the hat man. They had this sound-absorbing material lining the walls. When you went in there, I swear you could hear your own heartbeat. Now, I honestly don't know if the dead silence of the room aided in the building's haunting, or perhaps was the cause of the hat man legends in the first place. But what I will say is that the building creeped me out during the day. Imagine how I felt all the times I had to lock up that building when I worked for campus security, all alone at midnight. Thanks again, Claire, for submitting your story. It brought back fond, yet terrifying memories. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. It's finally summertime. Folks are hitting the lake, the trails, the campsites. They're doing outdoor stuff. They trek into the wilderness with a false sense of security. They believe that their large brain, opposable thumbs, and cell phone 
will keep them safe. But the truth is, an estimated 1,600 people a year go missing from national parks alone. It's almost like there's something out there taking people. Now, typically, dangerous places have a long-standing legend about them. Stories warning people to stay clear. Yet sometimes, these warnings become more apparent and more obvious. The following call was submitted by Gabby from the state of Oregon, and it just might detail one of those warnings. Hey Derek, this is Gabby, and I am in Oregon, uh, in the foothills of the Cascade Foothills, and uh, this is a Sasquatch, or what I think was a Sasquatch, and this is about six years ago. We live in a pretty rural area. We've got a lot of um, timberland, BLM, and uh, warehouser land around us, so there's not not a ton of homes, but there's some, and it was in the summer. We had all of our windows open. And oh, I'm going to say maybe it was about 12, 1 o'clock. It was summertime, and uh, down in the valley, across the road from us, we could all of a sudden hear this screaming. I mean, screaming like that I've never heard, uh, my husband's never heard, and it was just loud, really loud screaming. Now, I know that in a couple of episodes you had talked to people or have uh, mentioned, rather, that it could be uh, bobcat mating or fox mating, and I listen to those, which those are kind of quick. They stop, they go again, they stop. So it's sort of a, um, a mating call like that. But this was nothing like that. This was just a really, really loud screaming. So that is just what we thought. I mean, we <laughs> closed the windows because we didn't know what the heck it was. Um, and it, I mean, it sounded like a woman, but we didn't think it was a woman. But it was just really... A uh, very crazy scream, which we have not heard uh, before. And then I was listening to your podcast, which I love, by the way. Um, I listen to it at night when I can't sleep. <laughs> and so I was listening to it and heard about the whistle that that the Bigfoot gives. Now I never heard of that before until I listened to the podcast. But then I thought, well, that's I didn't put two and two together till today when I was listening to a podcast on uh, Bigfoot. And somebody had mentioned the whistles. Well, my son had asked me, and I've said to him before, hey, did you hear those whistles last night? And we kept thinking it was somebody just out in the woods. Uh, You know, I don't know why, but we kept thinking it was just people that are out in the woods. And he asked me, oh, a few weeks ago, did you hear that whistle? And I said, no, you know, I didn't hear it. And then one time we both heard it. And I said, yeah, I I don't know what that is. I said, maybe there's somebody out there, um, you know, just whistling to each other so I don't know if the two are connected at all but I thought after I put that together I thought huh maybe maybe that is it I mean Cascade Foothills it is Sasquatch area so that is my story love the podcast thanks Derek and I thought that the following call a call that was submitted by an anonymous source in North Carolina was also too relevant to pass up Hey, I just wanted to tell a story about some experiences I've been having. Just started the podcast and I've been really enjoying it and it's got me thinking about just sharing the, this weird experience I had. This happened probably three years ago now in rural North Carolina. I had gone to hang out with some of my military buddies as I had joined the Marine Corps at the point. I was a pulley waiting to go to boot camp and we went to one of the our friends who was also joining to hang out at his house and just drink some beers. Around two o'clock, me and my other friend, we went up on the roof just to hang out outside and drink some beer. And from there you could see across my friend's yard, which led into a big field with a pond. And after that, it was just woods. We were sitting there and just chit chatting. And all of a sudden we just started hearing this noise out in the woods and couldn't really hear it at first. It was sort of a, I don't know, I, I want to say whooping noise, but it didn't sound like something I'd heard before. And I'd, I've been hunting my whole life, so I've been in the woods a lot around here, and I've never heard anything like that. Well, we sat up there on the roof for about, I don't know, probably 20 minutes or so, and eventually we could tell that it was getting closer. And 
that night it was really dark. It was a moonless night. It might have been cloudy. I can't really remember that part, but we couldn't see anything out in the field, so we figured it was off in the woods. Well, me and my friend just kept listening, and after about, I don't know, another five or ten minutes, we heard this just real guttural, I don't I want to say roar, because it was just so loud, but I can't really, it just sounded like a scream. And after that, we heard a tree crack and fall over. So we go back inside and tell the other people that are part of the Marine Corps that, hey, you need to come outside. There's something screaming and knocking trees over in the woods. And so they grab their guns thinking, you know, it's some crazy, weird animal. But we get out there and we can still hear it. It's just thrashing through the brush across this field from us. And this field's probably only 400 feet like long then there's the tree line so we're not that far away from it and they set out and just come back and they say well there's nothing there we can't see anything so we decide to go out in the morning so the next morning we go out and we look for the tree that it knocked over we search for maybe 15 minutes and we come up upon this tree that was still green on the inside so we figured that was a tree but the thing was is this tree was huge i mean it wasn't like a tiny little tree it was this big like i want to say like a six inch radius tree like old but just it snapped off at the base like it'd been pushed over and just all around there's just brush that had just been ripped up and i've been in these woods 20 something years and i've never seen anything like that i don't even know what to think my friends say it's bigfoot but i'm kind of skeptical about that but that's something i just can't explain it's and i figured that y'all would enjoy this so thank you for listening to me and i'll be listening next week thank you now i'm not slipping on my tinfoil hat and i'm certainly not talking about conspiracies but the clues they might be right in front of us these places are dangerous. These parks are dangerous. And most of them have some sort of legend about a dangerous, hair-covered creature. Now, I have no doubt that these legends and stories were created to keep people safe. But the real question is, what are they keeping them safe from? Is it the cold grip of Mother Nature? Or, perhaps, the screams? It's an eerie recording captured on a cell phone of something that's making strange howling noises heard throughout Alert Bay. We heard it once, and I didn't get the recording, and then second time I got the recording, and that's what was on the back porch. Very eerie. The audio was recorded just recently on the backside of Cormorant Island. It's been heard by many all over the island. This summer I've heard it three times. I've heard it scream three times. But uh, it's been coming here for years. Whatever's been making the noise is heard primarily at night. Some say it's a dog, but others say that's impossible. With that volume, absolutely nothing. No dog can make that kind of a noise with that, with that volume. Art Dick hears the vocalizations just outside of his home. He's convinced the calls are from a Sasquatch. He believes the creature is real because of several previous encounters, like several years ago on a remote island further south when a tree was thrown at himself and fellow clam diggers. Pulled the tree right out of the ground. The branches were still on it. I don't know anything that can just literally pull a tree with roots and all. I mean... You know, you see that little alder growing out there. You try to go and pull it out, you're not going to be able to do it. While the howls and screams that have been heard throughout Alert Bay could be dismissed as simply animal noises, you have to keep in mind that Cormorant Island is a location where there is no wildlife. There's no bears, no cougars, not even any deer. And while you could dismiss the noises, there have been plenty of sightings. One person that's seen it, her father lives in Alert Bay, and she came up to visit her father. So she went up to the graveyard who um, pay respects to one of her family. And when she went up to the graveyard, she seen it standing there. She turned around and she got out of there right away. She didn't even go to the graveyard. And a more recent sighting when a group of teens were playing soccer near the band's big house. 
A large upright creature moved quickly alongside the building in just a few strides. Yeah, they took off right away. They don't even stay there anymore after the dark. Tomorrow on CTV News, a visit to the island by renowned Sasquatch investigator John Bindernagel, talking with witnesses and looking for clues, and will travel along. Gord Kerbis, CTV News, Alert Bay. That clip comes courtesy of CTV News out of Vancouver Island, Canada. Now, I have no idea what it is that's out there, but I do know that people are worried. Thanks again to both callers for sharing those stories. Before I play the final call of the evening, a couple little things. A quick reminder that I'll be part of a panel at this year's Alien Con in Los Angeles, California, Friday, June 21st at 10.20 a.m. I'll be up there with great minds from Blurry Photos, Hysteria 51, Into the Skies, Stuff They Don't Want You to Know, and Mad Scientist Podcast. The topic, UFOs in podcasting. And as if that wasn't enough, later that night you can meet me and a plethora of other podcast hosts at Scum and Villainy Cantina at 7 p.m. I certainly hope to see you guys at both. And speaking of all the mirrored men stuff, over on the Facebook group, we're doing a little contest. If the mirrored man inspired you to create something amazing, share it on social media with the hashtags MAU and mirrored men for a chance to win a Monsters Among Us prize pack. We'll probably run this promotion for another week or so, so don't delay. Submit today. And just like that, the new shirts from Brett Manning have been ordered. You can look for those things in the shop next week. And while you're at it, check out the rest of Brett's amazing work. Just simply search Brett is a girl on Google, Etsy, or Instagram. In a humongous thank you to Brett, uh, just this morning Sarah and I received a little package she sent uh, to commemorate our lost cat, Jack. So thank you, Brett, for taking the time to not only design the shirt, but to send us this little package. I can't tell you how much it means to both Sarah and I. All right, let's get back to the program. And while we're on the topic of Alien Con and meetups, last September I had the honor of speaking at the 2018 CryptidCon in Frankfort, Kentucky. While I was there, I heard a story that I just had to share with you guys. And luckily, the experiencer sent it in. So without further delay, the final call of the evening, a submission by John in Indiana. Hi, Derek. This is John from Southern Indiana. Actually, I told my story to you at your town hall meeting last year at the Crypticon. Been meaning to get around to telling, telling it on the show, so uh, here it goes. Um, me and my wife, we moved. She's originally from the town that we live in. We moved over, over here to Indiana in 2005. And before we moved over here, I'd, I'd heard some stories from people from my hometown about this area, like little stories here and there, but never... David, you know, two thoughts. Let's fast forward to about two years ago. My daughter, who is now 14, so this happened when she was 12, um, she was waiting on the bus at the end of the driveway, and I'm at work. I go in to work really early, and I'm at work that day, and it, it's a cold day, and she's, you know, waiting on her bus, and I get a text message from my wife that our daughter, Olivia, had texted her from the end of the driveway saying that she'd seen something weird across the road and my wife was and this this took place i want to say it was like late december early january i i i'm pretty sure it was late december early january because it was just right around the uh, school break that they had and you know so it, it was kind of chilly outside I, i'm not sure if there was snow maybe a light dusting but my wife joked around that you know she had seen a uh, scary clown across the road and you know i i laughed about it and did didn't say much to her, you know, because I was at work, so I couldn't really talk to her. So later on I, that day, when my daughter came home from school, I sat her down and we I asked her what happened, and she said that this is her her story of what she'd seen. She was at the end of the driveway and she was on her phone. She was waiting on the bus and she heard something. Well, right across the road, and we live in the country. We live on a county road. But there is, like, traffic, and there are neighbors, you know, fairly close to us. But she said right across the road she heard something. And in the 
the little area across the road from us is some trees. I mean, there's a lot of woods around us, but there's also clearings too. And she heard something and she looked up and she said what she seen was a humanoid figure, white, almost static you like, and it was running. And she told me, she goes, Dad, I could hear him breathe or whatever it was. She could hear it breathe. She could hear the mass in the leaves as it ran. And she told me, she's like, I could, I could hear, I could see it breathe. She, and she's like, I looked up and when I looked up, it seen me and it stopped. She goes, and then it just took off running the other way. I'm getting goosebumps telling you this story right now. Um, she, she said it just took off running the other way. And she said it felt like it was being chased by something. And, but she didn't ever see anything else. So I, I asked her, I mean, she's, you know, they're, she's a smart kid. Both, you know, both my kids are smart kids. They know what a deer looks like. <clears throat> they, they've grown up around, you know, woods and wildlife their whole life. So they know what a deer looks like. They can, I'm, I'm pretty certain they would be able to tell a deer from a white staticky figure. Uh, I asked her, you know, about how tall she thought it was. And she said, you know, from the angle, because it's kind of on the hill, she said she, she thought it looked fairly, you know, fairly tall. But the main important question I asked her was, was it on two feet or four feet? Because, or on all fours, because that can make a world of difference. Adamant. She is so adamant. It was two feet. She's, I mean, even to this day, she's like, it's just like it just happened. Um, and I believe, I mean, I believe her because it was probably a few years before that, maybe about seven years before that, I was weed eating the back of our, behind our house. And we don't have a very big, from our house to the woods behind, there's probably 10 feet. So it's not that big of a backyard. And I was back there weed eating and I seen something like a solid white uh, humanoid figure walk behind me but I seen it in the reflection of our bedroom window and as soon as I seen it I turned around and nothing was there and there would have been no place to hide I mean there's just no no place to hide because right where I seen it would have been I would have caught whatever it was when I turned around but there was nothing whatever it was it, I mean there was just nothing there so I was like well maybe it was me so I went back and forth for like five or six minutes in front of that window doing the same motion to see if maybe it was a reflection of something from mine in the mirror or in the window. Nothing, nothing. I never told her about that until she told me about her sighting. And then as I was, you know, preparing to make this call the past couple of days to tell you my story, I remember another time her and a friend had went down to our barn and said that, and they came running up scared because they said there was a, they seen a like a silhouette of a man in our barn i went down there and there was nothing could have been two young kids just you know lighting or something playing tricks on them very possible i mean very possible i can't can't rule that out but and then she had told me that a friend of hers that live up lives right up the road from us her dad had mentioned seeing something on a trail cam one time that was a white humanoid figure and that was about five years ago. So my daughter has this theory that it happens, something happens every five years, that this whatever shows up every five years. Now we don't live around like any military bases or anything like that. I mean, I heard stories from a guy I worked with that was from this area before I moved over here that there was some weird things that happened, honestly, just a few miles up the road from where, we're, where I live. Like nothing military, which I believe you asked at the uh, the con. So we're waiting. We're waiting. I think another two, maybe three more years, to see if something happens again. But she is. Uh, it still kind of creeps her out today, and I mean, I can't lie. It kind of creeps her out because as I'm telling you the story, I'm standing outside and I'm looking over in that area, and it is. I mean, what could it be? Like a white, staticky humanoid figure? Was it a? a rip in a dimension did she see something she wasn't supposed to see did it see her and didn't need to be seen we don't know hopefully somebody out there has heard you know had similar experiences love the show hope uh if you're a crypticon hope to meet you again this year uh keep up the good work and thank you thank you john i in fact will be at this year's crypticon and again will be hosting the town hall meeting so I certainly hope to see you there. 
and that goes double for the rest of you. Now John had mentioned that I'd ask about a nearby military installment. I did this with Justin and Jen, now Harley's encounter, in mind. You remember that they stopped at a road stop in Idaho, where they encountered two strange entities that seemed to be wearing some sort of cloaking device. Now my thinking here is that perhaps this technology was being used in John's yard, and somehow went on the fritz, and instead of showing a green distortion, it displayed a design more fit for urban or snowy environments. But that certainly wouldn't explain why they were in John's yard to begin with. It does make me rethink one other category of sightings, however. Sightings of a lesser known variety. White Bigfoot sightings. Some of the people that I've talked to about it, uh, they've heard these strange screams that sounds like a, a woman screaming in the woods. People describe it as a Sasquatch or Bigfoot type creature with white hair. Some people describe even a smell similar to dead animals. So the Alabama white thing, and you gotta say thang, uh, that's how people describe it as, uh, is a creature, monster, uh, cryptid, that has been sighted in Alabama since the early 1900s. Lots of people have seen this, especially in North Alabama, uh, around the Huntsville area, uh, Montesano Mountain, and surrounding areas. Some people describe it as a Sasquatch or Bigfoot type creature with white hair. Other people describe something quite different as a sort of like a kangaroo with like a cat head. It's about seven or eight feet tall. One girl who saw it said that it stood up straight on, on its two legs and looked at her, but when it ran, uh, it ran on all fours. So there's a lot of different descriptions about these things. And if you'd like to find out more about the Alabama white thing, uh, please search for my channel, Spectral Wolfpack Paranormal, on YouTube, where I have a mini documentary that I put together about the creature. And if you've had a sighting yourself or some strange experience with the Alabama white thing, please reach out to me because I'm always interested in hearing about people's experiences with this creature. That video comes courtesy of MagicCityWeekend.com. If you've laid eyes on the white thing, please submit your story to Alex Bobolinsky, the voice you just heard. A link to his video and his documentary can be found in the show notes for tonight's episode. Now, I suppose the point I'm getting at here is that perhaps people think that they're seeing these white Bigfoot-type creatures. Infamous sightings like the Alabama White Thang and the Lake Worth Monster. But are these, in fact, static entities? And of course, this begs an even bigger question. What are these static entities? Like a spooky, creepy, and unsettling onion, we're forced to peel back the layers, one story at a time, until we get to that golden nugget of truth. Thank you again, John, for sharing your story with us once again. It's definitely not the first and certainly not the last strange white humanoid sighting we've heard on this program. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Addie Lloyd, Warren Pon Abbott, and Tony Bell. The amazing music that you're listening to was provided by Coag Music. And all audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Thank you all for listening, and until next week. for the final story of the evening. And I'll tell you what, you guys are getting rewarded this time. The following submission was sent via Chris in the state 
of South Dakota, and just might detail some more mirrored men. Hi, Derek. I heard the podcast and it sparked a memory. My grandma and grandpa lived on the South Dakota side of the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. I only heard about this years after, and it was brief, and it had to have taken place somewhere between the 1970s and 1980s, best I can figure. But they're passed away now. Basically, they were driving back home on an old road, way out in the country late at night. Now, Grandma associated these things with the men in black, and it wasn't until your podcast that I thought different. But anyway, there were three guys in suits and hats, and they seemed to have car trouble. She said the creepy thing was that they were all hunched over looking at the engine at the same time. Then they all turned around at the same time. And then, as if that wasn't strange enough, they all shuffled out into the road and stood in my grandparents' oncoming lane, making them easily illuminated by the headlights. And all three eerily stuck out their thumbs like a hitchhiker would do. But the kicker here is they did it all at exactly the same time. My grandma and grandpa just drove on by. There was no mention of time loss or anything else, but it was just super creepy how they all moved in unison. And when my grandma told me the story, she just got chills and shook her head. Thanks for letting me share, Chris. Well, thank you, Chris. I sure can't say definitively if this was a mirrored men encounter or not, but at least half the requirements are there. Three entities, strange movement, strange dress, strange location. And just because there was no missing time remembered doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Thank you, Chris, for taking the time to share your story, and thank you for sticking around to the end of the show. Have a great night.